ערב טוב. Good evening. Beyond uh, the formal introduction, if I were to speak from my heart, I would so, say so much praise about our chief of staff, but uh, this uh, threat will not be realized, but it is definitely my delight and the IDC's delight and all of our delight to host the chief of general staff here this evening. I have spent many a long hour with him in discussions and in other forms of contact, and he is a rare combination of determination creativity, but also sanity and stability in terms of having to do everything we can in order to not engage in conflict or go to war. But if we were to go to war, our force, the force behind the blow dealt to the enemy means deterrence will come back and achievements will be made. For dozens of years, I have seen many leaders and commanders, and I have not seen anyone quite like this current Chief of General Staff. I'm sorry to be saying that, but he is really so comp calm. He is so full of uh, experience, of complete matter-of-factness. He has insight that is really beyond compare, and I have indicated that and in hinted at it in what I said, because we are currently in a very unique situation that is based on the defense system, based on the IDF, and the Chief of General Staff has a key role to play, a unique role to play in this context, and a lot cannot be said about that. I am really so moved and excited to be having the Chief of General Staff here. I am so happy, and please may we hear uh, Gadi Eisenkot, the Chief of General Staff of the Defense Force, to say his word to the distinguished guests. Good evening. I would like to truly welcome all those who are present from the world and from Israel, Professor Reichman, Major General in Reserves, Amos Gilad, my dear friend. Usually, I feel good as a vet veteran soldier in tents, and uh, this is a different kind of tent here. Let's hope I keep to the challenge. Let's talk about the actual changing threats and the security threats, about the strategy in various arenas, and in short, about the actual um, force construction that how does one do so in a changing reality and the changing of the threats and the foes, etc.? It's not simple. We marked 50 years since the Six Day War that was on three fronts that ended with a military achievement that was amazing and amazed the world. But in, in that war, there were three basic terms in the concept of security deterrence of 11 years during the period between the Sinai campaign in 56 till the Six Day War in 67. In other words, an effort that was of the force construction that was actually pretty impressive and from the point of view of the achievement of that lull. And secondly, in other words, that warning that all of those in the army that they were able to actually point out what the various risks are and that is exactly what happened and what the dangers were. And the third one that was manifest in that force and that was a decisive victory and a very impressive one. In fact, within a number of hours, most of the air forces in the first uh, cycle of the and after that, a very decisive maneuver in the north and in the south and the Judean Samaria con conquest and of Jerusalem. And uh, there was a committee who sat down uh, to write actually with uh, Dan Mary Dor chairing that to explain what the security concept is. And they brought in a fourth term in the basic terms of our security concept, and that was defense, basically. That which shows there is a change 
in the last 11 years, the committee already then identified it in the, the changing of those threats. I mean, if we talk about that first circle around Israel, and uh, it was the Hezbollah who built it and designed it, wherein they started going into urban terrains that was densely populated, or the use of tens of thousands of rockets, and of course the whole strategic idea where in the Israel home front is their main target, and that is the way that the organization chose in order to cope with the asymmetry against the IDF. And of course, and since then, we have seen many terror organizations working under the auspices of the population, within the population, within these urban terrains. So if we're talking, I think that one could discern that here in the past, you, there were states against states. We're talking about air forces, armies, with control and command, with navies, and ground forces. And 50 years ago, that was what the war was like. And now there wasn't, there's a sort of secondary factor. It was used to be, but it used to be between um, armies and usually in open spaces, although there were always civilians perhaps that were casualties and they suffered. But undoubtedly, those threats have changed. Reality has changed immensely. And when you explore those, the very strategic environment and our surroundings, one can discern that, first of all, there is a superpower, very intense involvement in the Middle East. And one can see it in a very focused manner with one, what, what is happening in Syria, that the activities there, the Russians and the um, Americans' ongoing involvement with a desire to actually move out ISIS and the al-Nusra and the second movement. And in other words, ongoing activities of these two superpowers in one state while coordinating, but also friction between them, especially what's been happening even in the last few hours. And the second issue that we're moving from a kind of state army or states, we move to guerrilla forces. Uh, for five years, I was in the, the North Command. I used to get up and I used to see uh, a state legion with, uh, with a state that had its various, um, that, that one can actually deter with a kind of organized uh, logic. And they had divisions and they had platoons and they had uh, brigades and divisions. But now, if you look at the Golan Heights, you can see Hezbollah, a Syrian army, you've got Shiite militias, Al Nusra Front, the Jihad, the World Jihad, and you can identify ISIS, you can see the Syrian army, and various local organizations all at the same time. These terror organizations with a kind of state capability, that's an additional component that we've identified that is happening as a result of two main things. The first thing is the dismantling of these countries and the capability of these organizations to to get state arms. Uh, you're talking of a battery of uh, UAVs, of rockets, of missiles, with computerization and even, even encryption. And the other issue that, we're, that we always worry us is that they actually, Iran, for example, are actually equipping and arming all these organizations like Hezbollah, and you can see them, the Gaza Strip, Hamas, the Islamic Jihad. The additional factor that we've identified is the is through the, the actual civil population, they create that kind of deployment in urban terrain of where the densely populated areas that ISIS and the World Jihad do that, and they spread themselves out there. And those are challenges that we had to contend with over the last decade. So there are additional armies now. For example, the American coalition and the Russians are actually having to face that. You can see that in Mosul, Raqqa, and you can see that also in Daar. And we saw that in the Gaza Strip and experienced that and in Lebanon. The next component is the main target of the actual enemy that has become the civil population, especially if we're talking about the first cycle circle around the state of Israel. We're talking about terror 
that was connected perhaps more to the Middle East and the anarchist movements, now they are troubling the entire world. It is not only a problem that is characterized here in the Middle East and worries us. It's not only terror organizations, because that same terror that has developed that we say inspired or lone wolves that carry out terrorist attacks that bring about attacks that we've seen, for example, in Jerusalem, but we've now experienced them as well in Orlando, London, Berlin, Brussels, Paris, and in a number of other places. I think for 50 years post the Six-Day War, one can openly say that the strategic balance of the State of Israel has improved significantly alongside the complexity and the challenges that we experienced over the last decade. And in that complexity, that will actually show our intel and air force supremacy, the cybernetic one, the ground forces ones, that we have the supremacy of our army against the terror organizations that are working from within the, their home front. And it's, we've kept to those challenges. But our response to those threats has been is based for many years on a defense strategy, in other words, multidimensional ground, air, naval, against that pattern that they have adopted and was structured over the last um, decade. In other words, the launching of missiles against our territory and that kind of capability that really does uniquely personify Israel that one can say really is unprecedented and is a, is as similar to anything around the world. We're talking about precise missiles and capability, and we're talking about air supremacy of not only one that can actually hit thousands of targets during 24 hours, but the capability of maneuvering against an army that was perhaps neglected over the 10, 12 years because all the resources were given to the battle against terror. And now this is a capability that over the last decade has really been invested in and developed and fostered. The third component is the actual strengthening of our stability and our competitive edge, which is based on people, technology, warfare. In other words, collaboration, a strategic one, which is based on military collaboration with the army in, in the United States, but with other military country, uh, the countries and their military, which creates a supremacy as compared to our neighbors. And that we have actually contributed to the coalition in the Middle East and to the United States states because understand, the people understand what the IDF can contribute and that collaboration is also witnessed with the, um, when you see and it is attested to with those moderate countries in the Middle East, some of them covert, some of them overt. Alongside all that in the IDF strategy, there are principles that have actually been consolidated should there be a threat necessary that there will be a multi dimensional capability of actually meeting any threats that are attacked against us. In other words, we're talking about a multi-tier defense level. There's nothing that we, that anyone else has when we're talking about this interoperability. We're talking about ground, naval, air, and even on the cybernetic force that has been improved. And also this, not only on the front line, but also in the depth and we'll be able to answer any fire, and we can, we can describe the capabilities of their statistic weaponry. The IDF and our Air, our Air Force has a unique capability with tremendous force that is really incomparable to anyone else in the Middle East that they can actually really attack, they can target very precisely. And also the evacuation of population for the sake of their defense. The moment we know that the, our enemy goes into urban terrain, which is a very professional issue because we can't carry out our tasks. It's also a matter of morals and values because we're talking about urban territory where there are hundreds of thousands of, of civilian populations. So we need to evacuate them in order to allow us the freedom of movement. That is as important as we need to remove that um, threat on our population. And that is something on our shoulders. And we have to do it as quickly as possible with as few casualty as was possible and collateral damage. We also have to preserve the legitimacy while fighting 
and at the end of any battle or fighting as not only a moral edict as an army, an Israel defense force, and a state, a Jewish state, and also part and parcel of our military achievements. And you can see the various um, complexities in the cast lead campaign and in our last one in the protective edge in the Gaza Strip. And the last component, which is of the paramount importance, is that the decisive victory, which is actually comprised of two main parameters. First of all, the way the IDF fulfills its aims that were defined by the political echelons. And the second component is that you need a perspective of strategically improving its Israel's situation over time, and that really has a tremendous difficulty to actually judge here and now doing so, sometimes even on the last day of the actual fighting. Over the last years, there is a kind of new pattern that exists, and people usually um, quote Clausewitz when they say that an, an army could be in two situations, either preparing for war or during fighting. And we understood that the change of the threats needs a third one. It's incumbent upon us not to only prepare for war or to be in a state of war, but that specific campaign between the two, that that we have to have in order to weaken our enemies and cut back on their, uh, the multiplying of their forces, and we have to empower our intel so that we will be able to detrimentally affect the legitimacy of our enemy and through we need to deter them from a position of power and continue the normalcy and resilience of the state of Israel. So when we look at that as an overview, then the border with Syria has been quiet for 44 years despite the chaotic reality there. So we have good security situation in the, the Golan Heights in Lebanon. Also in the last 11 years, it's allowed since the second Lebanon war with all the criticism that was actually cast about the achievements during that war and in the Gaza Strip over the last three years since the end of the Protective Edge campaign we also have witnessed a quiet, which is for the sake and the benefit of the civilians on both sides. Now I would like to relate to the central and the main challenges. And first I would like to talk about the threat against Israel from Iran, which starts with the ideological approach that uh, believes in the eradication of the state of Israel, the destruction. And Ali Jafari just spoke over the last 24 hours, and he said that Iran's aim is an, a world Islamic control and regime of the IRGC, and they have said so publicly. And we're talking about a, a very important, influential character in Iran. And the effort uh, of this regional issue has, we've been seeing for many years, Iran believes it is a superpower in the region and is trying to control and really implement its whole, the Jafari, um, the Revolution Regards whole ideology. We're talking about $800 million that they get in Lebanon from Iran every year. And Ali Jafari has done that. And we have seen the effort in the Gaza Strip of about $70 million per annum, plus their effort to try and influence the Islamic Jihad and Hamas, although we're speaking about a Sunni entity. We see that in Yemen and Bahrain as a kind of regional concept. They want a kind of crescent that would be half Shiite, that would be from all the way from Iran to Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon as well. And just two days ago, they launched, after 30 years, that there wasn't actually an interstate launching of missiles that was from missile. They launched missiles towards Syria, to Deir Azor, and their operational achievement was much lesser than was actually shown on the, in the media. But that was an expression of... Uh, something that although, yes, that we can't talk about precise uh, harm and what they're actually very proud to talk about. So 
the Israeli industry is not only influencing the Iranian capabilities, but it has a regional impact. They want to have precise missiles. They want to reconstruct things and to have UAVs, unmanned vehicles. And one of them, actually just a few hours ago, was toppled by the Americans in the north of Syria. We're talking about uh, Shiite militias and the Syrian armies and the Houthis in Yemen and trying to have very advanced uh, weaponry, the, gar the strip, which is part of that hegemony that they see. And perhaps the elections in Iran have now expressed the desire of uh, the rank and file, perhaps. In addition to that, you can see all those multi-influential factors that are really um, permeating everywhere, and uh, not only, and this is all part of what is surrounding us. So perhaps those terror attacks in Iran were part of the price that Iran is going to pay for its involvement in the in the Sunni states and its involvement against ISIS and the Al Nusra Front. Although, of course, we have learned a lot through about that only through the media. So the bottom lines are that the Iranian vision to achieve nuclear weaponry is still a center and a focus of their whole policy. Although, yes, some of those capabilities have been curbed. So the effort m must be of all the countries so that it shouldn't turn into a North Korea. Therefore, that challenge is ongoing of the State of Israel because we have a very high capability from the point of view of the role of preventing nuclear weaponry in the hands of Iran for the sake of the security of the whole region and uh, Israel and the entire world. So, in other words, stopping this kind of military development of Iran should be, a t should be a desire and objective of all the moderate Sunni countries and Israel and the others, because this is an, in an interweaving of all the, the, the wishes of even China, the United States, and uh, although at the moment the Russians are fighting on their side in Syria. I think, I think that this focus currently on defeating ISIS and neglecting addressing the Iranian impact is a problem. I think that there is an interest here to have Iran go back to Iran to minimize its regional impact. And even though its tactical impact is positive uh, in the out view of the uh, axis in terms of Syria, I think that Iran is still the problem and not the solution, even if we do manage to have some tactical achievements. And now I'd like to talk about Syria. The civil war there is a terrible tragedy. Looking at the findings, 22 million civilians, six years of war, over 600,000 casualties, 2.2 or 2.3 million wounded, 6.7 million refugees, over 6 million misple uh, displaced, and damage of $270 million worth damage to infrastructure. We do not have a pride or a happiness seeing the killings in Syria, and we have made an effort in the region, in the space that we can impact. And we must look ahead to a decade or two down the line and understand that in a country where there is no education system for six years in many places, where there's no infrastructure, where there's no law and order, there is a generation that is raised and it's very problematic we have an interest in a stable entity, a functioning entity on the other side of the border. The strategy elected upon the beginning of, these, of this war six years ago is, in my eyes, one that was justifiable. It is both smart and value-based. The strategy had several principles. One, preserving the security reality, the security status quo that has begun in 1974, a quiet border where life is lived and where the land is worked and processed. And the other point is not to be involved in the war in Syria. I have read all sorts of articles and papers. Israel is by no means involved in the fighting. 
It does not go alongside any of the sides. We have a clear interest to prevent advanced weapons from coming to Hezbollah, getting to the hands of Hezbollah. Yesterday, the media said that there has been action to prevent such advanced weapons from getting to the hands of Hezbollah that can harm Israel. It has been this way for many years and it will continue to be so in future. We will do everything in our power to prevent advanced weapons from reaching Hezbollah that may serve to attack Israel in the future and its civilians. There is a perception called good neighbors, which has been continuing for many years and whereby we help civilians. And over the last three years, 3,000 wounded Syrians have come and been hospitalized in Israeli hospitals, among them hundreds of children who come to our Israeli hospitals and are treated as part of the defense budget. They are treated and it is our basic duty and there's also an initiative to help them. They the humanitarian equipment is also uh, helped. We help move tons of equipment in order to help organizations that are international also support this effort. I think this is our basic duty as neighbors and Jews. And in any case, we are no, not involved in any way. We think that ISIS should be defeated in Syria and anywhere else. It is a high priority objective and we are contributing to that by helping our friends against ISIS, against world jihad in all of our capabilities, including intelligence. As I've said, preventing having advanced weapons get to the hands of Hamas and Hezbollah is a top priority of the IDF. It has been this way for many years and is done every day. We have made great efforts to do that. We also insist that foreign forces come out of Syria, leave Syria, Iran and Hezbollah, a third of which is involved in Syria and Shiite militia. Just uh, to sum up, I want to say that Syria is a turning point, a key point inter alia because Right there, we have the United States and Russia. We have the struggle and battle between Shiite, Shiites and Sunnis. Iran is trying to create this crescent from Iran to Lebanon. And Syria is perceived, in my view, as a key point for defeating ISIS, for weakening Iran, and for strengthening and promoting the moderate Sunnis in order to create a better regional reality. Just a, brief, a few brief words about Lebanon. Hezbollah as an organization is currently being perceived as the key threat to Israel in the first circle that envelops Israel. Hezbollah has built a capability, as I've described, that is based on dozens of thousands of short-term, medium-range and long-range rockets. It also has other capabilities it receives from the Syrian army and from Iran. Part of it is Russian warfare, Russian weapons that is getting to their hands under the noses of Russians and without their approval. Hezbollah has impeded and has uh, violated Resolution 1701, which requires demilitarization in this region and we have very good intelligence and we know the layout of Hezbollah very well and we see this Shiite organization in 240 villages and towns. Almost every third or fourth house has some Hezbollah force in it. Thousands of underground locations in southern Lebanon, dozens of thousands of rockets and other capabilities that are violating, rudely violating Resolution 1701. Hezbollah over the last three years has been in a very complex reality. A third of its force is camped in Syria and is involved in fighting. They are getting military experience that we cannot ignore. But on the other hand, this organization is losing 1,800 of its combatants. It has lost 1,800 combatants over the last three years. It has 8,000 wounded. We identify various issues of morale, of involvement among young Shiites who are fighting in Syria and have been told that they are protecting and defending Lebanon. We see a deep 
leadership crisis manifest clearly in the fact that the commander of the forces, the fighting forces of Hezbollah, Mustafa Badr al-Din, was assassinated just minutes after he ended a meeting with Qasem Soleimani. And he was assassinated by his commanders in a place that should have been very protected for the senior command of Hezbollah in Damascus. And I think that indicates just how deep the complexity and the problem and the crisis that this organization is undergoing. And they have yet to find a replacement for this commander. There is a very big problem in terms of budget. They have to finance the fighting in Syria. They have to finance 1,800 families of those who died. They have to treat 8,000 who are wounded. And there are very major internal issues that are manifest in those correspondents who toured southern Lebanon, followed by the prime minister of Lebanon, who appeared, Saeed Khariri, who uh, came out with a declaration that was completely 180 degrees the opposite. The Hamas officials who were told to go from Qatar to Syria, that is also a problem. I think uh, that the PLO in the 1970s, who were also told to go uh, from Jordan to Lebanon, and what that did to Lebanon, I think, that we should remember that, and the government of Lebanon should definitely address this issue and is responsible for addressing this issue. Nevertheless, there have been 11 years of quiet and a good security for the welfare and benefit of the civilians from both sides of the fence, from to the north of it and the south of it, the understanding that the Lebanon Lebanese army is currently uh, deployed uh, across the fence and the understanding that it is the Lebanon government's responsibility and that Hezbollah is in that country where the responsibility is of uh, the Lebanese government. But yet we all understand that the biggest guarantee, the best guarantee for continued quiet is being very highly prepared, having high intelligence capabilities, being able to attack Thousands of targets a day should we be required to do so. A very uh, a capability, a maneuvering capability that has really improved in recent years and the ability to defend the Israeli home front. And despite the reality we have described and despite our interest to have Hezbollah get farther away as they have been required to do under Resolution 1701, we want this quiet to continue for years ahead. And from there to the Palestinian theater that has definitely had the IDF very much uh, engaged over the last year, we have prevented an eruption of violence uh, thanks to professional work and actions. We have seen a new pattern that we have not seen in this, uh, to this extent. It's not an organization sending young people to carry out terror attacks, but decisions made by individual young men and women, Palestinian women and women, who have attempted to carry out terror attacks, including two or three hours ago when IDF soldiers, there was an attempted uh, stabbing there in the Benjamin area. We are in a very volatile, very uh, on the brink of explosion in terms of humanitarianism, and there have been decisions made in Ramallah, and there's a link between these decisions made in Ramallah and the reality we see in the Gaza Strip. The decision to cut back on the payment of electricity and the payment of salaries and the financing of medical treatment and medicine has a direct impact on the reality and our, on our capabilities to provide security. And we are making great effort, particularly in Judea and Samaria, but also in the Gaza Strip, to allow for a better economic civilian reality, understanding that this is a shared interest, an Israeli interest. This inspirational, this inspirational terror that I've talked about, this individual terror, as we see in Israel, this perception, this view of reasonable security over time and having a fabric of life that is reasonable in Judea and Samaria that relies on effective military capabilities and intelligence capabilities allowing to thwart terrorism before it goes out. And here we found a new reality that required adaptation and adjustment of views 
of intelligence methods, of technology, better understanding the social media and networks, and most importantly, the operative end. And unfortunately, we saw over the last weekend in Jerusalem a very harsh terror attack, the likes of which are prevented each and every day in Judea, Samaria, and East Jerusalem. And here the capability of handling this reality is first and foremost a result of the policy of using force properly and reasonably, a policy of force, use of force that is determined to battle terror while allowing civilians to live their lives. The tendency, this Pavlovian tendency of having sieges and so forth is a bad idea. And therefore, we have recommended, and this recommendation has been accepted, that we continue to allow the hundreds of thousands of civilians go out and work, go out and work in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and many other places, understanding that they just want to put bread on their tables and not be terrorists. And from this database that is 90,000, not a single terrorist has uh, been and that's why this approach should continue, even in tough da days. In terms of the use of force, doing it in a determined, focused fashion, with the instructions uh, of firing that are very, um, very rigid, we only want to harm those who are about to harm others' lives, or one who has, uh, been, uh, has failed to carry out a crime. And more importantly, or no less importantly, is our economic civilian approach and the fact that this morning in Judea and Samaria of 2.8 million inhabitants, 400,000 people came to um, provide for their families and 600,000 students are going to kindergarten, from kindergarten to university, creates a rhythm and dynamics that explains the constraints, the hope, and the lack of desire on the street. But look around and see what happens in other countries in the Middle East. And here, over the last few days, the civil administ administration have, has uh, been uh, under scrutiny and the ability of the State of Israel and the IDF to provide security and a sense of security to the um, citizens of Israel and to engage and to manage uh, the fabric of life in the Judea and Samaria region, and that has its role to play in this. And we must say that the Palestinian apparatuses uh, should be admired for the way that they are working, understanding that this is a shared interest, collaborating and coordinating with the IDF for the benefit of both sides, and I think that should be praised and uh, commended. In the Gaza Strip, reality is very complex. We see, on the one hand, a reality in terms of security that is the best since 1967. Over the last three years, not a single Israeli citizen has been scratched. One Israeli soldier was lightly wounded, and 46 rockets were unfortunately launched, 40 of them to open spaces near the fence. And there have been a very limited number, four or five cases, where it hit constructed areas, and it could have been a uh, terrible uh, tragedy, but uh, thankfully no one was hurt. And internally, in the Gaza Strip, it's been a decade since Hamas has taken over, and Hamas is now at a crossroads where they must decide whether they are a responsible regime, responsible for two million civilians, or a terror organization that sees everything through the prism of a terror tunnel and the desire to carry out terrorist attacks. And if I were to take electricity as, a, as a, an analogy, then we have been criticized for not uh, financing the gap that the PA has decided to take away from Gaza Strip in terms of electricity. And in f as far as we're concerned, it is our interest that Gaza has electricity 24-7, so they have proper water, education, employment, hope. It is an in Israeli interest that this be the case. But it's a paradox that we finance the gap in their electricity quote, whereas they use hundreds of thousands of dollars to 
uh, dig tunnels and attack us on Israeli soil. And that is the alternative, and therefore we have decided to place responsibility on Hamas. They should be the ones responsible for their inhabitants. The underground threat has really been uh, uh, of concern to me, even though we have developed an advanced capability and modestly, I can say that it is the most advanced capability in the world, both technologically and physically, and I assume that these achievements will be seen in soon. Uh, these days, I do not identify an interest of attack on the Hamas side. Hamas understands it is inferior to us. It understands how strong we are. It has undergone a harsh experience three years ago, and yet it is our duty, a basic duty as the IDF, to have the test of the capability on the other side and understanding that tactical events on the ground may develop and evolve into harsh events, and we have seen many such cases in the last decade, and therefore we are very much prepared. It is our top priority and in the IDF to be prepared, to be ready. Readiness and preparedness is a top priority for the IDF. Also on the other front, and to significantly improve our intelligence capabilities and our assault capabilities, alongside the hope that the reality of the last three years will continue for many a long year. I would like to say just a few final words on the Sinai Peninsula, marking 40 years to the peace agreement with Egypt, which is a strategic asset to, for the state of Israel. Egyptians are, in, are battling with uh, terror the whole time. Uh, the Sinai Peninsula has seen ISIS operate from it, but the Egyptians have been battling against it very effectively. They have also managed to uh, harness the tribes in the uh, Sinai Peninsula. They have made quite a few accomplishments, and if that is the place, it is actually the place uh, to defeat ISIS, the first and foremost arena where they can be defeated. I would like to say just a few final words on the changing threat to the structure of force and the questions that we ask ourselves about the way that we should be building force uh, against this threat. Because the nature of war has not changed, the threats have changed. I have begun by saying and by introducing the changes and our understanding that we must be highly prepared in the long term for the next three or four or five years, understanding that the strategic reality of the State of Israel in 15 or 20 years' time will be much more complex. And here lies the challenge to make plans, to build plans. One of the next five years, and there is such a plan called Gideon, and in the, we are in the second year formally, practically in the third year. It relies on understandings with the Ministry of Finance and the five-year budget that the IDF receives, which allows for optimization in the structure, in the full structure, and risk management in an educated fashion at the top of its priority list is being prepared, having more training, more equipment, having more uh, investment in the people, uh, both in the mandatory and in reserves and in all uh, the various ranks, and understanding that the key to the quality of the IDF lies first and foremost in the people, even though they are tempted, or we are tempted to go to technology, which is also very important. And the other components is one that other armies also see as how they can strengthen themselves in the near future, which is integration and networking and robotics and special forces and intelligence and protecting borders, and there is a very stable plan that has been approved by the cabinet and is for the benefit of all. And at the same time, in the IDF, there has also been very advanced staff work toward a long-term 2030, 2040, that's the year we're looking ahead, knowing that the reality in 20 or 25 years' time will be much more complex, identifying a strategic balance of Israeli power in this time frame and an opportunity for a revolution in the force, in the, in the building of force that combines intelligence, air, land, and cyber capabilities, and to build for the next generations better conditions in which to battle and cope and grapple with the reality. And from that, I would like now to move to the bottom lines. 50 years since the Six-Day War, 
So, and 70 years since the inception of the State of Israel, the main challenges and the threats are actually taking on a different attire and they will be spread out for many a years. And if we take the terror phenomenon, for example, it's not uh, really comparable to crime, but it's something similar to that from the point of view that we'll have to cope with it for many years. But what is worrying me for many a years and the IDF and me as a chief of general staff is the the fact that we must always keep the IDF as a people's army and one needs for that partnership and commitment of all the young people in the state of Israel. And we have to increase the number of people who are enlisted. Of course, we are not foolproof and people do criticize us, but we have understood that this is a state people's army and its commanders believe very, that they are acting very professionally and they are in searching for the security and that is what they're interested in of the state of Israel. And that is in the light of criticism um, criticism that is constructive, we're willing to internalize and improve. Uh, when I'm talking about things that were not to that point, we're talking about four or five main challenges in the IDF. The first is to prevent war, to supply security in that sense of security and to exert every effort so that we should uh, increase the normalcy window and the quiet and not out of fear or blindness, but out of uh, power and cloud so that we know that this will contribute to the resilience of the State of Israel and make it burgeon and develop in various domains. And the key to that is security. And the second challenge is to win in any war, in a war against terror, if we're talking about or a more widespread one, and one has to do so in a decisive manner so that we will be able to fulfill those objectives that were defined for the IDF, but, in, but most specifically in order to, inc to improve the strategic um, upper edge of, of Israel and to prevent future campaigns. And now, thirdly, we need to provide them that sense of security to all the people in Israel, and the military echelons have to provide that through force, I mean power that they have and strength and make all the decisions for the benefit of the State of Israel because of our strength and not because we feel that we are being, we, there's pressure being wielded upon us and because of uh, and due to bloodshed and other things that we experienced about a decade ago. And fourth, we have to adapt the force constructions adapted to the various threats in a, an appropriate manner. And we have to know how to also invest in R&D for the future as well, and not only the present, but additional platforms like technology and in people so that the IDF will retain its qualitative competitive edge and will be able to retain what it was created for. It's, it is as a defense force, and the prerequisite for that and ensuring the future. And the prerequisite will be we have excellent, outstanding, committed people who see it as a mission in their eyes. And they should be recognized and appreciated by the people of Israel. And they should also be remunerated for it. So I would like to thank you that you enabled me to address you here and wish you a very interesting and contributive con um, conference and one that you be believe is very fruitful. Thank you very much.